Hi scholars, Ms. Yosef here and welcome to Wednesday's lesson. As you know, we just started a new module, module six, it's our last one. And today we're doing lesson two. Our objective for today is to be able to construct or make a coordinate system on a plane. We're going to begin with fluency on page 87. There is workspace in your packet. On that page, I would like you to figure out what the missing number is on the number line that is on the screen right now. So on this number line, you'll notice that the first digit that you have, your origin, where it starts, zero, is on the right of the number line. Typically, we're used to seeing this on the left, but the orientation has changed here. So I'd like you to be aware of that. So your number line starts at zero and it ends at 60. What we first need to do here is figure out the units that are in between the zero and the 60. From zero to 60, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten equally spaced units. That means if I do 60, because it's going from zero to 60, divided by those 10 equally spaced units, then the value of each space here would be six. So if I were to find the value of A, C, and B, I would use the logic that a single space is six. So A is six. I would skip count by sixes to get to C. So six is here, 12, 18, 24, C is 24. Continue on with my facts of 6, my multiplication facts, and B would be 42. I can confirm that these are actually 6s by continuing on that skip count. Here's 42, 6 more would be 48, 6 more, and then 6 more would get me to 60. I would like you to try this one on your own. In one minute, I'm going to put up the answers on the slide. The value of j is one third. The value of k is four thirds or one and one third. Remember, every improper fraction has to be changed into a mixed number. And the value of l is eight thirds, which as a mixed number becomes two and two thirds. If you're confused about how we were able to find these uh, fractions here, let's walk through this one really quickly. My origin is at zero, and this number line, as of now, ends at three. In between the zero and the three are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine spaces, nine equally spaced places. So zero to three, three whole units divided by the nine, three nines, simplifies to one third. That means the value of one space here from zero to j is one third. From j to this next space is another third and another third and another third, so on and so forth. Here's an another one. Take about a minute, solve these ones, and on that time, I'll put up the answers on the screen and I'd like you to check your work. Our application problem is on page 88. 
The picture shows an intersection in Stony Brook Village. The town wants to construct two new roads, Elm Street and King Street. Elm Street will intersect Lower Sheep Pasture Road, run parallel to Main Street, and be perpendicular to Stony Brook Road. Sketch Elm Street. Before going on to B, which is going to be about King Street, let's focus on Elm Street first. The problem tells me that Elm Street will intersect Lower Sheep Pasture Road. Intersect means to cross or to touch. So Lower Sheep Pasture Road, let's find that. It's right here. So I know Elm Street, wherever I end up putting Elm Street, has to cross in Lower Sheep Pasture Road. Elm Street will run parallel to Main Street. So here's Main Street. I want it to be parallel to Main Street and perpendicular to Stony Brook Road. Perpendicular means it will form a 90 degree angle. So there are three things that I want here. I want it to be perpendicular to Stony Brook Road, parallel to Main Street, and intersecting Lower Sheep Pasture Road. So that would be Elm Street. Those three things are there. Here's that 90 degree perpendicular angle Elm Street is parallel to Main Street, and notice Elm Street is intersecting or crossing Lower Sheep Pasture Road. Let's do B. King Street will be perpendicular to Main Street and begin at the intersection of Upper Sheep Pasture Road and East Main Street. Sketch King Street. All right, let's begin from up here. King Street will be perpendicular to Main Street. All right, here's Main Street. I want King Street to be perpendicular, meaning it's going to make a 90 degree angle. So I know that King Street would be a vertical road as opposed to Elm Street, which is a horizontal road. King Street will begin at the intersection of Upper Sheep Pasture Road and East Main Street. Here's East Main Street and Upper Sheep Pasture Road. This is their intersection, the point at which these two roads meet. So I know that starting at this intersection and going vertically, I would place King Street there. That way, not only is it starting at that intersection, but King Street also forms a 90 degree angle with Main Street. So those two streets are perpendicular to each other. All right, we are going to begin our concept development the notes for your concept development are on page 90 and 91 in your packet. I would like you to follow along with this video and take notes on those two pages because those notes are going to help you with your independent practice for today. We're going to begin with page 90 at the very top of page 90. Number 1A. It says use a set square to draw a line perpendicular to the x axis through points P Here's point P, Q, and R. Then it says label the new line as the Y axis. So there's a word here that we haven't seen before that I want to talk about, a set square. A set square is really any kind of ruler or any kind of straight object that you can use to draw straight lines. Now with that set square, I'm told to draw a line perpendicular to the X axis. Here are my three x axes. And to draw a line perpendicular, I want a line that is going to make a 90 degree angle. So I'm going to start with this one here, point P. The x axis is a perfect horizontal line, so my y axis is going to be like that, straight up. That way it's making that 90 degree angle, perpendicular lines. Point Q. The x-axis is not really a perfect horizontal line, right? It's a diagonal line. And because it's sort of tilted this way, to make a perpendicular line, that line also has to be tilted as well. It can't look like the y-axis for point P. So for point Q, my perpendicular line, that would be my y-axis, would look like that. Notice that it's also tilted to match the tilted x-axis, and it seems like it's making that perfect 90-degree angle as well. 
Let's go to point R. Point R also has an x-axis that is tilted, except it's diagonal in the opposite direction as point Q. But just like as we did for point Q, my y-axis is also going to be a little bit tilted. That way it's making that 90 degree angle with the tilted x-axis. We're done with 1A. Let's move on to 1B. 1B says, choose one of the sets of perpendicular lines above and create a coordinate plane. Mark seven units on each axis and label them as whole numbers. I'm going to do part of this with you and I'd like you to finish up the remaining part of the problem. So it says choose one of the sets of the perpendicular lines above. I'm going to select this one here for point P. All right. And then it says create a coordinate plane. If you remember from yesterday's lesson, coordinate plane has the X axis and Y axis and then it has units on both of those axes so that we can plot points. I'm going to plot points on the X axis. These are the seven points that it tells me to mark. Mark seven units on each axis. I've only labeled them on the X axis, but what I would like you to do would be to mark these same units up on the Y axis going vertically, and you would number them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Number two, use the coordinate plane to answer the following. A, name the shape at each location. So in this problem, there are a few things that are happening. You notice that there's a coordinate plane here, and you notice that my x-axis is right here horizontally, and my y-axis is right here vertically. And on that coordinate plane are different shapes. What I'm doing in 2a is using the x coordinates they give me and the y coordinates that they give me to find the actual shapes that the coordinates are pointing to. Remember these coordinates are like directions. Let's do the first one. The x coordinate is 2, the y coordinate is 5. So I would read this as 2 comma 5. I'm going to use those directions to figure out what shape they are directing me to. I'm going to start at 0, 0 of the origin where the y and the x intersect where the y and the x axes intersect. And I'm going to go on the x axis first. My x coordinate is 2. Then I'm going to go vertically on my y coordinate 5 units. Right there. I got to a triangle. I can confirm that the triangle is actually five units from the y-axis because I can look over and see that it's at five. So the shape that it's directing me to is a triangle. The next one, x-coordinate of one, y-coordinate of two. Again, I would read this as one comma two. Starting at my origin, zero, zero, I go over one unit on my x-axis and two units vertically on my y-axis, and that took me to a circle. Five comma six. I start at zero, zero. What is this area called? It's called the origin. I'm going to go horizontally five units on the x-axis. Then I'm going to go vertically six units on my y-axis. It took me to a square. I would like you to do the next one, 6, 5. In a few seconds, I'm going to put up the name of the shape on the table. Six comma five directs me to an octagon right here. It is six units on the x-axis, and it is five units on the y-axis. 2b, which shape is two units from the y-axis? This question is a little bit tricky. It's not asking you which shape has a y-coordinate of two. What it's saying is which shape is two units away from the y-axis. 
So that means when I find my y-axis, which is right here, I'm looking for a shape that is going to the right two units. And in a way, that would actually be the x-coordinate. The x-coordinate would have to be 2 because the x-coordinate is the, is the axis that's moving away from the y-axis. And it's a little bit confusing, but let's, let's go step by step. Here's my y-axis. I need something that's two units away, to the right. It can't be this parallelogram here because the parallelogram is lying right on the y-axis. It can't be the circle here because the circle right now is only one unit away from the y-axis, so its x-coordinate is y. Let's go to this triangle here. If I start at my y-axis, I can jump over one unit, all right? Jump over another unit, I got to the triangle. So this triangle looks like it is two units away from the y-axis. It's exactly what I'm looking for. You'll notice that the x-coordinate of the triangle is also a two. It's the one that we started with. So when it's asking you, oh, I'm sorry, put up the next answer, but when it's asking you, when it says away from an axis, what it's really asking is the unit of the opposite axis. That's a concept that we're going to practice a little bit more in the forthcoming lessons over the next few days. So 2C, I went ahead and accidentally put the answer up there, but I'd still like to talk about it. 2C says, which shape has an x coordinate of zero? So when I'm at here, zero comma zero, the intersection, I'm looking for a, um, a figure that is lying on either one of these axes. But it can't be this um, pentagon here because the pentagon has an x coordinate of six. That means when it went from zero, zero, it went over six units and didn't have a y axis to go up over, so it just sat there. The reason it's this parallelogram is because when I start at zero, zero, the parallelogram doesn't have an x coordinate to move over this way. And it only has a y coordinate of one to move up that way. And that's why the answer is a parallelogram. For D, which shape is four units from the y axis and three units from the x axis? D is kind of like a B. Looking for a shape that's four units from the y axis, here's my y axis, and I would be moving four units away to the right. That means the x coordinate would be four three units from the x-axis. Here's my x-axis. Three units away would be up, so the y-coordinate would be three. So I'm looking for a shape that has the coordinate points of four comma three. Start at zero, zero, go over four, go up three, and I get to the diamond. And I can confirm that the diamond meets those criteria. The diamond, is it four units from the y-axis? Well, let's check. Here's my y-axis. One unit, two units, three units, four units. It is. Is the diamond three units from the x-axis? Let's check. Here's my x-axis. One unit, two units, three units. It checks out. Number three. Number three in this problem set matches with number three in your independent practice. Number three says, use the coordinate plane to answer the following. This question is rather similar to number two, except here, instead of finding the shape, we're working backwards. We've been given the shape on the coordinate plane, and instead what we're doing is finding the x coordinate and the y coordinate. We're finding the ordered pairs. Before we begin, the first thing that I want you to notice here is that your x-axis and your y-axis are now split into fractions. You have a half and whole numbers as well, but they're also units in between the labeled numbers. So that means my units are actually not in halves. I can count from zero to the next whole number one and figure out that between zero and one, these are actually split into fourths because there are four equal units. 
So what I need to do is use my concept of equivalent fractions to change all of these halves into fourths. This is a scale that we've done several times throughout the fifth grade year. So my units on this coordinate plane are in fourths, and I need to change one half to fourths. I'm going to start with my denominators. The denominator two, to be changed to an equivalent fraction of four, was multiplied by two. Two times two is four. That means I need to multiply my numerator one by two to get two fourths. So there are two fourths in one half. I'm not going to change the value of every unit on this coordinate plane, but what I want you to keep in mind as we're, as we're figuring out the x and y coordinates is that when you see a half, that's actually two fourths. When you see one and one half, that's one and two fourths. When you see the spaces in between a zero and a half and a half and a one, in there is one fourth and three fourths. So one fourth, if you're looking at my clicker, here's zero, one fourth, two fourths, which is the same as one half, three fourths, one whole. All right, let's begin. My smiley face, let's find the smiley face, it's right here. I'm going to start from zero, zero, that's where I always begin. But first I need to find the x coordinate here. Starting at zero, zero, I'm going to go all the way over. Two is the x coordinate for the smiley face because it's right under the smiley face. And the y coordinate of the smiley face, I'm going to go all the way over, is 1. So I have 2, 1, 2, comma 1. Let's do the diamond. I'm going to start at 0, 0, like I always do. I'm going to go on the x-axis first. I'm right underneath the diamond here, so my x-coordinate for the diamond is a 2. Now let's find my y-coordinate. I'm going to go to the diamond here and track my way back to the y-axis right here. Now you notice that this line here is between 3 and 1 half and 4. 3 and 1 half is actually 3 and 2 fourths, right? 3 and 2 fourths. Between 3 and 2 fourths and 4 holes is 3 and 3 fourths. So the units of my diamond are 2 and three and three fourths. If it helps you on your packet, if going between one half and two fourths is confusing, I would recommend that you pause this video and change every one half into two fourths and then label the units that are in between, the one fourth and the three fourths. That way you're able to keep track of the different coordinates that we're trying to figure out. Sun is next. Again, I start at zero, zero, my origin. My sun, let me find my sun first. Here's my sun. You notice the sun is lying on the y-axis. So if I'm starting at zero, zero, and the sun is on the y-axis, that means the sun doesn't really have an x-coordinate because it hasn't really traveled along the x-axis. So the x-coordinate has to be a zero. The y-coordinate for the sun I notice is between a three and one half, which is really three and two fourths, and four. And between three and two fourths is three and three fourths, so the y coordinate of the sun is three and three fourths. The full ordered pair of the sun is zero, comma, three and three fourths. Our last one, the heart. Here's my heart. I'd like you to take a few seconds to figure out the x coordinate of the heart and the y coordinate of the heart. The heart is three and three fourths comma zero. The heart traveled only on the x-axis, but it didn't travel upwards or vertically along the y-axis, and that means its y-coordinate is a zero. That's why it did not travel vertically. B, name the shape whose x-coordinate is one half more than the value of the heart's x-coordinate. There's a lot happening in this problem. I'm finding a shape, there's still more shapes on this coordinate grid, 
whose x-coordinate is one half more than the value of the heart's x-coordinate. Here's my heart, and here's my heart's x-coordinate, three and three-fourths. So I need to find one half more than three and three-fourths. That means I'm adding three and three-fourths plus one half. That's what one half more means. Notice my denominators are different here. We did a lesson on this previously. If my denominators are different, I need to find a common denominator. But luckily, I already know how many fourths are in one half. One half equals two fourths. So I can just change this one half to become two fourths. So my new equation is three and three fourths plus two fourths. What is three and three fourths plus two fourths? The sum of 3 and 3 fourths plus 2 fourths is 3 and 5 fourths. I kept the whole number and I just added my two fractions here. But notice 5 fourths is an improper fraction. 5 fourths is the same as 1 and 1 fourth. So that 1 and 1 fourth plus the 3 here would become 4 and 1 fourth. So now I'm looking for a shape whose x coordinate is 4 and 1 fourth. Here's my 0. I'm going to go along the x-axis 4 and 1 fourth times. I've gone too far because right now I got to 4 and 2 fourths. I need to go back by 1. This one here, the star, has an x-coordinate of 4 and 1 fourth. C. Plot a triangle at 3 comma 4. 0, 0. Origin. I go on my x-axis 3 units. And I go four units on my y-axis. And right there, I would plot a square. I'm sorry, plot a triangle. D, plot a square at four and three-fourths, comma, five. Here is zero, zero. Always start at zero. Go four and three-fourths units on my x-axis. Four and three-fourths is past four and one-half, or four and two-fourths. So four and three-fourths is right there. Then I go five units up on my y-axis, and I plot a square right there. Lastly, plot an x at 1 half comma 3 fourths. 1 half is 2 fourths, so I'm plotting a square at 2 fourths comma 3 fourths right there, an x. Again, this one matches with number 3. So as you're having a hard time with number 3 in your um, independent practice, I'd like you to come back to this part of the video and re-watch it to help you with your homework. Number 4. The pirate's treasure is buried at the X on the map. Here's the X. How could a coordinate plane make describing its location easier? I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about this question, but before I give you those seconds, let me give you some ideas here. Think about what exactly ordered pairs the x's and the y's are doing and what they're helping us find in a coordinate plane. So x's and y's on the coordinate plane are directions, right? They give us directions about where to plot points or where the points are plotted. They tell us where they're plotted. In this case, if I drew an x and a y coordinate, I would be able to see the exact location of this x and the exact location of this tree. And that would tell me the exact location of where I can find the treasure. Coordinate points, the x's and the y's, are just like directions. It's like a map, and it tells you exactly where to go. Your Wednesday independent practice is on pages 92 and 93. The questions on that independent practice look very, very similar to the questions that we just did in this video. So if you're stuck on number one, go back to number one that we did here. If you're stuck on number three or number four, go back to number three or number four that we did here. They match up very well. 
I have a few reminders for this week. The first one is to please make sure you're watching the videos from Mr. Sheelan for ELA and Science and Social Studies videos from Ms. Corkins. And also, as you're doing the independent practice, don't forget to text us the answers to your questions in your work packet. There are places in your packet where we've indicated the answers that we would like to get from you. Remember, sending us these answers help us help you in terms of making sure that you're understanding the work and you're able to keep up with um, what it is we're doing from home. And lastly, please make sure you're working on both iReady Math and iReady Reading lessons each week. The goal for you is to have at least 45 minutes for math and for reading at the end of the week. All right, that's all for today. I hope you have a great day. Remember, you can reach out to me um, via text, call, or email if you have any questions. Bye, fifth grade.